Good evening, everybody. My name is Sean Haney of Real Agriculture and Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147 on Sirius XM. And I'm pleased to be one of tonight's two moderators for the Canadian Federation of Agriculture's 2021 Leaders Debate. Tonight's event is fully bilingual, and joining me as my co-moderator is Martin Menard. He's a journalist with La Terre des Chenoux. Martin will be moderating a series of questions in French after our first break, and so we're going to hear from him in a little bit. Special thanks this evening to the Food, Health and Consumer Products of Canada. They are the exclusive sponsor for tonight's debate. And of course, special thanks to our debate participants this evening who have taken time away from their, their, their campaigns and their own riding. They have dialed in remotely. We appreciate your time and commitment to this great industry of agriculture. Pre-pandemic, Canadian Agri-Food was the second largest employer in Canada, accounting for one in eight jobs and contributing $140 billion annually to Canada's GDP. During the pandemic, food production was rightly identified as an essential service and showed tremendous resiliency in the face of one of the largest disruptions in Canadian history. Farmers have faced a host of challenges, including COVID-19, climate change, and trade disruptions over the past few years. But despite it all, agriculture is a leader in environmental sustainability and can lead the Canadian economy post-pandemic. Today, we hope our candidates can show us how they would unlock the tremendous potential of Canadian agriculture and how they would navigate the obstacles that stand in the way of achieving this potential. Here are the debate rules this evening. Participants have drawn for speaking order that will be used for both the opening remarks and the sequence in which they will answer the debate questions this evening. Each debater has up to one minute for their opening and closing remarks. There will be eight core questions and a set of four rapid fire yes, no questions as well. For the debate questions, each participant has up to one minute to answer, followed by two minutes of open debate. The order in which the candidates answer first will be evenly split. For the rapid fire round, each participant provides a yes, no, followed by 30 seconds for each candidate to either expand on their answer or respond to a fellow participant. There will be two short breaks featuring a message from our sponsor and also a message from Real Agriculture. Join the conversation online using hashtag AgDebate2021. It's my pleasure now to introduce our debaters this evening in their speaking order for their opening remarks. First up will be Mr. Yves Perron. He is of the Bloc Quebecois. Ms. Marie-Claude Bibeau of the Liberal Party of Canada. Mr. Dave Epp, Conservative Party of Canada. And finally, Alastair McGregor, New Democratic Party of Canada. We'll now begin the formal debate. Let's get going. Our first, or sorry, opening, or we're going to go to the opening remarks first. Sorry. Uh, we are going to start with Mr. Perot. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here with us to follow this discussion, which will be highly instructive. I'd like to warmly thank the organisers of tonight's event to give us an opportunity to speak up about our ideas. It's a tremendous privilege to be here on behalf of the Bloc Québécois over the past 20 months. I think that our political party has demonstrated through its serious proposals, its collaborative approach, that we are a relevant political party and that we have made real concrete uh, action throughout the agricultural world, of course in Quebec, but also Canada-wide. We've shown how relevant we are and we've showed that we have been able to pave the way in the agri-foods and agri-sector to stand up for what is required for farmers. And I have my own vision of the farming world, agricultural sovereignty, environmental partnership and standards reciprocity and well these are the three major themes that we'll be able to discuss thank you mr perot we'll now move on to the opening remarks of madame bibeau Merci. Bonjour à tous. Thank you and uh, good evening to everyone. First woman minister of agriculture and agri food in canada i've been working hard together with producers and processors across the country 
You know that I'm a straight shooter and that our liberal government has delivered concrete results. We have opened new markets for our Canadian products, invested in science and innovation, improved business risk management programs, and Im implemented new on-farm programs to become more climate resilient. These actions have helped the sector reach the highest exports level ever seen. But we know there are challenges, and you can count on the Liberal government to support you, including throughout the pandemic and the devastating drought and wildfires. Together, we will come out stronger, grow the sector, and advance the fight against climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Bebeau. It is now time for the opening remarks from Mr. Rep. Thank you, Sean, and good evening, all. Canada's Conservatives understand that Canadian agriculture is not just about farmers. The road from field to fork begins before the field with the many input suppliers and supply chains to our farmers. And the path to the plate here and abroad involves supply chains, including transportation, processing, marketing, and retailing, and many more. And it also includes our reputation. All of these supply chain relationships exist through various market mechanisms. Conservatives understand markets and competition. They understand that the markets only work when there's a balance of power among its participants. Conservatives understand that the egg industry impacts and is impacted by the environment, both natural and human. Egg has the opportunity for a leading role in Canada's economic recovery and food security but we need a government that understands agriculture. And that is a conservative government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rep. It is now time for the final opening remarks from Mr. McGregor. Good evening, everyone. You know, a local producer in my riding once told me that farming is either for the courageous or the crazy. And I think a lot of you will understand those remarks given the challenges that we are facing as a country in our agricultural sector in this 21st century. Farmers know that a healthy environment is key and very much, very much key for successful farming. But the thing is, is that we can meet these incredible challenges that 21st century is going to present us because our farmers are already uh, practicing many of the innovations, making use of the technical things that we have. And what they need is a, a real partner in Ottawa, one that is going to listen to their needs and respond to what they want in terms of policy. Over the last three and a half years, I've been proud to serve as the NDP's agricultural critic, and I look forward to tonight's discussion where I can share a few more ideas on the environment, economy, and infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. It is now time for our first question, and it is going to be about the next policy framework. Canadian farmers know that innovation is key to economic growth and improving environmental practices. Innovation takes money. At a time when farmers are facing increasing costs due to climate change and carbon taxation, funding for the agriculture policy framework has remained stagnant for nearly 20 years. And if you can believe it, doesn't even keep pace with inflation. With the next Ag Policy Framework on the horizon, how would your party improve it to ensure farmers have the resources they need to drive innovation and profitability? We will start with Mr. Perron. Oui, merci beaucoup. Yes, thank you very much. Well, listen, obviously I think that we need to overhaul a number of business risk management programs, do away with red tape, paperwork, such that it takes one year that companies that have faced losses receive money, support and relief. We also need to increase relief for the agricultural sector. It's not normal when we call upon our sector to compete internationally that our agricultural sector isn't supported as much as it is in the United States. In fact, not even half as much. Something else that needs to be included in renegotiating the ag policy framework is to change the process to support farmers on the upstream. 
and make sure that they get support on the front end and not wait till they face losses. Support them directly so they enjoy more financial autonomy and make their own choices as a consequence. Thank you, Mr. Pro. Madame Babo. Thank you. Well, I've been working with my provincial colleagues for two years and a half. And we've been meeting almost every week uh, during COVID to make sure that we were collaborating to improve the programs and to put in place the best programs for our farmers. And we've been able to reach a consensus together to increase agri-stability by $95 million per year already by removing the reference margin limit, which was a big a big deal because this was the cause of a, lo of a long process. It was unfair for different sector. And now we're, I'm very proud that we made this happen already. We have also another proposal on the table to increase the compensation rate from 70 to 80%. And we are waiting for the conservative provincial governments to join to make it happen. But looking forward, I'm in the process with my provincial colleagues to improve the business risk management programs and to also introduce uh, the notion of climate risk because uh, the world is changing faster than we, we would have thought. And this is important to make sure that our business risk management programs meet this new reality. Thank you. Mr. Epp, it's your turn. Thank you, Sean. When I talk to our farm community, when I talk to the industry that they serve and is served by them, what I keep hearing is that they experience the attitude of an Ottawa knows best. What they're not experiencing is a true partnership. And that, I guess, is the attitude that a Conservative government would bring. As has been mentioned, we need to review our business risk management programming. We need to review our regulatory framework, not throw it away. We're known for that, but we may need to make it far more efficient because not only in agriculture, but in other parts of our economy, we are, have fantastic innovators here, but they're commercialized elsewhere. We just, as an egg committee, finished our egg processing capacity study. Too much of our product is exported in a raw state. We need far more collaboration amongst government, amongst industry, amongst our provinces to do, add more value here at home. And a Conservative government would bring that collaborative attitude to this industry. And finally, on question one, Mr. McGregor. Thank you. I think the next agricultural policy framework really needs to be built around the theme of resiliency. This is a, a, used repeatedly at committee and, and, and I have questioned many of our producers about. The last 18 months have really exposed a lot of cracks in the system. And, you know, I agree that we don't want an Ottawa knows best approach, but we do want a strong federal leadership in many areas. We know that this next century, uh, climate change is going to be a huge factor. And in fact, many of our farmers are now repeatedly telling us that they are on the front lines of climate change. So the next agricultural policy framework in discussion with the provinces is really going to have to center on how we manage the risk from climate change, what it's going to really do to our producers. How can we uh, build resiliency into local processing centers to make sure that communities have access to locally grown food? These are all big themes that have to be centered on in, in terms of resiliency. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Okay, now that we've heard from all of our candidates on the first question, is now time for our two-minute open debate. I turn it over to the candidates to interact and uh, really go after this topic. Well, Mr. Hepp, I would be interested to know how much you're going to invest in uh, the, uh, the improvement of the business risk management, because the last time the Conservative were there to negotiate. You have got hundreds of millions of dollars in these programs. So how could the farmers could believe that you would be there to improve these programs while we, the Liberals, have already improved them by $95 million and we are in our way to do much better? Madam Bevo, the agri-recovery program, the Western drought that we're facing right now, has been led, the response to it led by the provinces. The federal government didn't step up to match their 60% until hours before this unnecessary election. When you are negotiating with the provinces, at the 11th hour, you dropped a proposal on the table, giving no forewarning to our provincial ministers of agriculture or their officials to properly evaluate. 
That's not collaboration. That's not partnership. We are collaborating. That's what's very required well, and here. I have a good collaboration with my counterparts, and we were there. And actually, you know what? We have put 400 million more on the table for agri recovery. So we are doing things the right way, and we are doing this in a very collaborative. A after the province has put their said, money up, yes, at the eleventh hour, you came colleagues. in. Well, I just have a question, if I may. Ms. Bibo is right to say that there were major cutbacks by the Conservatives in 2013. That's correct. We need to remember this. And we're trying to catch up and from that. Ms. Bibo, on the Agri-Stability Programme, we know that uh, not all of the provinces have accepted uh, the demand. You had put forward 80%. Uh, and uh, some of the provinces just don't agree. Do you intend to move forward with the UPA's proposal to go ahead with the provinces that don't want to go ahead with it and that the other provinces can opt out so that there can be a second tier of the agri-stability program that doesn't penalise other regions in Canada for those that don't want to join that program? Response, well, Mr Perron, I understand what you're asking. We did propose a compensation rate to the tune of 80 per cent, i.e and increased. And the BRM program is subsidised 40% by the provinces, 60% by the federal government. We need at least two-thirds of the provinces and territories to sign off on this before we go ahead. And for the time being, it's the Conservative provincial governments that are putting a, a hammer in the works. We need the federal government to have programs that apply across Canada. Well, I'm fully aware of that, Ms. Bibo. I'm fully aware of that. I'm sorry to to uh, interject, we we're going to have. This is going to be a lot of fun. I can I can tell. Great discussion. Let's get to the second question, and it deals with. It was already mentioned, the drought and disaster relief. This year's drought is a prime example of the extreme weather events farmers deal with, despite support from governments from across the country. Many producers have struggled to compete in feed markets due to more timely and robust U.S. supports, suffering immense stress that force difficult decisions with long-term consequences for their farm or ranch. Do you believe Canada's framework for agricultural disaster response should be changed to help farmers through extreme weather events? If so, what would those changes be? For this question, we're going to start with Madame Bibot. Thank you. Well, we have already spoken about the business risk management programs, and I think these programs can be improved and take into consideration climate risk. And this is exactly the conversation that has already started with my provincial colleagues and with the industry, of course. But in addition to that, we have to be proactive and we have to support our farmers to be more resilient to this new reality. This is why we are putting in place a $200 million program to give farmers incentives to adopt better management practices like rotational grazing, like cover cropping, like better, better management of, of the nutrient. And we will triple the investment uh, into the clean tech programs because it was so popular a few months ago that we will triple the investment to reach almost half a billion dollars to help farmers afford energy efficient equipment, uh, for example, to grain, to, uh, to dry, uh, dry for grain dryers, uh, farm heating, or precision agriculture, for example. And we have other programs in mind to give us, to incentivize yeah. the uh, and more. Okay, thank you. Mr. Epp, your turn. Yes, thank you. The review of the business risk management program was promised by this government, and it's still not done. So what we have in place right now is agri-recovery. The province has stepped forward. Yes, the provincial, uh, the federal government put forward a small amount of money, uh, nowhere near to the disaster that our Western colleagues are facing. And so it was, again, leadership from the provinces that finally was matched at the 11th hour. What about the tax? I mean, right now there is livestock starving or livestock herds being dispersed. What about the livestock tax deferral? Right now, I'm aware of in Ontario 40,000 bales of hay waiting for some federal help on transportation to get to those needing that. Where is that leadership from the federal government? Thank you, Mr. Epp. Mr. McGregor. 
Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, more help is going to be needed, uh, not only for, for what's happened this year, but in future years. I mean, it's very important for us to understand this is now going to be a long-term trend, and we are going to see more and more of these extreme weather events. So if, if we don't start changing the policy to seriously confront climate change, uh, our farmers are going to continue to see these effects. And we have to ask ourselves as a country, how many more future tax dollars are we prepared to spend to mitigate against the effects of climate change before we understand that the smart money is to make those critical investments now. Um, I think one of the important things that we can do is, is to help farmers, um, you know, give them that support in, in better soil management techniques because we know that healthier soils are better able to withstand droughts and floods. It's one of the reasons why I was proud to introduce a private member's bill to try and establish a national soil conservation strategy. It's going to require a lot of different things coming together, but action is definitely yep. needed because this problem is only going to get worse. Okay, thank you very much. And Mr. Perron. Yes, thank you very much. Indeed, we need a rapid response, and I think that the four people attending this debate will agree with this. Financial assistance and disaster relief, well, this is, of course, a disaster, but it's true also in the case of diplomatic conflicts which directly affect some crops. The aid, the assistance needs to be direct and quick, and an emergency relief fund will help that. That's highly relevant. In addition to that, I refer to an environmental partnership earlier. Of course, all farmers want to protect the environment. And it's in our best interest to do so because we depend on the quality of soil and the climate. But we need to take collective responsibility. We can't put all the responsibility in terms of change of practices on farmers. When it comes to shorelines, for example, Everyone will win if we protect our waterways. So it's a win-win-win. We need support on the up road. Okay, thank you very much. We've heard from all the candidates. It's now time for our two-minute open debate. Let's get after it. You've got two minutes. So I think our this farmers, is a perfect opportunity for, our, for farmers to really look at the individual climate change plans of each party because they, they have to be serious in order to actually start reducing the amount of carbon that we're putting in the atmosphere. And rather than be reactive to this problem, I think smart policy is for us to be proactive, to start looking at those strategies that reduce our emissions, but also make sure that we are encouraging farmers to play a central role in, in fighting climate change by being net carbon sequesters. I know a lot of farmers are doing this already, but I'd like to see Ottawa play a leadership role in helping encourage more of that, those agricultural practices. As we heard I totally at the committee agree with from you, Ag, uh, Ag officials, when they testified to us, um, agriculture in general across Canada since 2008 has increased their output, but GHG emissions have remained steady. They have not gone up with output. That's unlike Canada as a whole or many, many other industries. Our farmers are innovative. Our farmers are responding without punitive taxes. I agree that we need to, we, that's not good enough. We need to continue. The Conservative platform has $3 billion uh, attached for an enhanced support, enhanced incentives, both for ag and forestry. But agriculture is already taking the lead without government. Now we can only come alongside and help in a partnership, not in a top down. I agree that our farmers are good stewards of the land and for years they have done their best to protect their land, to protect our environment. This is the most precious thing they have, but they definitely need support now. And we have to do more and we have to do it faster. And this is why we are putting all of these measures. And Mr. McGregor, when you said, you know, it's important to work uh, to look forward, we are investing in research and innovation as well because, you know, when the Conservatives come, they cut research centers, they cut investment in innovation, and then it creates a hole for the years to come, and we have to start over again. We are investing significantly in environmental research. Okay, we're going to move on to question je number three. Je Some je great je debate. Well, I understand. We're going to, we got to move on. I'm sorry. Um, the, the next question addresses value-added agriculture and food processing support. Food manufacturers and Canadian farmers work together to turn crops and farm goods into the finished products that fill our grocery stores. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed that Canada's food security depends on reliable agri-food supply chains and domestic food production. The question is, what do you see as the largest threats to the resilience and growth of Canada's food production sector? What would you do to address these challenges? And for this question, we're going to start through our rotation with Mr. Epp. Thank you, Sean. One of the threats, the largest, that's hard to pick. There are several here challenges. Labor is certainly one of them. Labor both at the farm level, but at our grocery level, they are having very much difficulty attracting enough labor, uh, but in the meat cutting sector is one that's part of our platform to address that as well. Just the supply, the value chain relationships, particularly between our retail sector and our processors. The Conservatives pushed this government to introduce a grocery code of conduct to address some of the abuses in that industry. So that is, again, to bring some stability and predictability to those relationships will certainly increase the comfort to invest in Canada by our further processors and our food manufacturers. We'll now hear from Mr. McGregor. Thank you. I, I would encourage anyone who hasn't already to uh, take a look at the committee report from the Standing Committee on Agriculture and Agri-Food because our, 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 our report on processing capacity in Canada, I think, was very comprehensive and displayed uh, a great um, partnership amongst all the parties. But we feel that that report uh, very accurately reflected what people on the ground were feeling. And COVID-19 really did expose some weaknesses in our supply chains. So going back to that theme of resiliency, I think uh, you know one of the biggest threats is, particularly with, with uh, meat processing, is in many cases we have put all of our eggs in one basket. And so when, uh, you know, in the future, if, if those processing facilities are threatened or shut down, suddenly many of our primary producers are, are left on the hook with, with a tremendous backlogs. So the way we have to counteract this threat is we, we have to make sure that processing capacity is expanded and diversified so that local communities have access to those value-added processing facilities and can get more money on the products that they make. Thank you. Mr. Perron? Thank you very much. Indeed, labor has already been identified as a major risk. But I'm very glad to see the outcome of the uh, election, and I take my hat off to them. It's going to be 20 per cent foreign workers in agri-foods. I think that's crucial. We need to do other things in terms of labor. Regional processing was raised by my colleague, Mr. McGegger. That's also highly relevant. And our report has been comprehensive on this. At the Standing Committee, on agri-foods and agriculture, we also noted chronic underinvestment in processing sectors. And that worries me in the long term and over the long haul. It's important to invest in infrastructure at the front end rather than having to shut down facilities and have to reopen elsewhere. So I think that we need a massive investment program to modernise facilities. In the context of a labour shortage, we also need increased productivity. How do you produce more with f fewer people? And that's through technological enhancements. So there's a whole host of issues in play here. Thank you very much. And we'll finish up with Madame Bibot. Thank you. Well, uh, labor shortages is definitely a very big issue right now. This is the thing that I hear the most about uh, in the field. And we do have a full strategy to face it. First, around the temporary foreign worker, we are on our way to proceed and we are committed to, to do this modernization and reform of our temporary foreign workers program. First thing, to recognize the trusted partners, the, the trusted employers, which are the most, you know, most of our farmers are very good employers, and we want to make it more easier and uh, more predictable for them to uh, to hire these foreign temporary workers. Uh, we want to reduce the red tape and we want also to increase the mobility because this is something that is has been asked from both the employers and the workers. Um, processing is another important issue. I agree we have to strengthen our regional food supply chain and to support yep. innovation within. Okay, well, hey, thank you. thank you very much. Okay, we've heard from all of our candidates. It's now time for that another two minutes of open debate. Let's open it up to the field. 
Minister Bebo, I agree with what you said about the temporary foreign worker program, but that's not what I'm hearing from the industry. I'm hearing that it's very, very difficult to get LMIAs through. It's very, very difficult to make those changes and that the attitude that they face is not one of making that program better. And I, I apologize if I missed some of the testimony. I believe my I froze and I had to reboot here for a second. But we need far more laborers coming in. It's always Canadians first. The program's set up for that. But we need to attract more people into this country, both at the field level, at the meat processing level, and at the processing level. And what I'm hearing is that this government is not conducive to that, despite all the nice words. We're going to go to Mr. Well, uh, Perron. He's trying to get in here. Uh, Let's. I'll turn the field uh, over to him. Well, thank you very much for that. I have a question for Ms. Bibol. You spoke about enhancing the temporary foreign workers programs, but I'm not entirely in agreement with what you proposed. Last summer in the block, we didn't wait to go onto the hustings to make proposals. We proposed a whole slew of measures, including an impact study on the labour market over five years, so that uh, there would be three-year renewable visas, renewable for an additional year, and also to provide for foreseeability. Recently, we proposed biometrics at arrival in Canada rather than the country of origin. Why didn't you respond to those demands immediately, and do you envision following up on them? Absolutely. We carried broad consultations out over the, recent, over the past year. We're trying to bring as many temporary foreign workers to Canada as possible, even in the midst of a pandemic. It's been a particular challenge, but we were successful with the support and collaboration of all partners and stakeholders, and we have a commitment and undertaking to overhaul the temporary foreign workers' programs, including a number of measures to cut back on paperwork and red tape to make it more predictable, foreseeable in the long term, so that our good employers don't have to repeat the process year in, year out. And we also want to put in place programs programs that provide for the dignity of workers and their job security and to simplify the lives of our employers. Do we have a time frame, Ms. Bibble? This was proposed a year we've ago got, already. We've got to, we're through our two minutes. Well, Man, that two minutes go so fast. <laughs> it is hard to believe that we are already through our first three questions. It's now time for our first short break featuring a message from tonight's exclusive sponsor, Food, Health and Consumer Products of Canada. Hello, my name is Michael Graydon, and I'm the CEO of Food Health and Consumer Products of Canada. We are honoured to be the exclusive sponsor of the Canadian Federation of Agriculture's Leaders Debate. I want to take this opportunity to thank the candidates and their respective parties for their thoughts on the critical issues and opportunities facing Canadian farmers and food manufacturers. For those of you who are not aware of FHCP, we are the voice of Canada's largest manufacturing employer. Our industry, nearly 10,000 facilities can be found in every province, providing good paying jobs, strengthening communities, and adding more than $39.9 billion to the economy every year. Canada's food, health, and consumer product manufacturers make the foods we love, the over-the-counter medicines and natural health products we trust to treat our common ailments, the paper products that clean up life's little messes, and so much more. Consumers have trusted FHCP member brands for more than a century. Canadian food manufacturers transform our country's agricultural riches into value-added finished goods that feed families here and around the world. We work closely with the Canadian farmers and are the single largest employer in rural Canada, serving as a critical link between rural and urban communities. Throughout the pandemic, our member companies took all necessary steps to provide Canadians with everyday essential products on store shelves. We know food security continues to be top of mind for many Canadians. And right now, we have an important opportunity to work together to strengthen the agri-food sector so that we can build Canada's resilience and self-reliance. I hope all of our industry stakeholders, political officials, and the public find value from today's debate. It has never been more important to discuss how we can continue to feed our country and the world. I thank the CFA for the opportunity to sponsor this debate, and I thank all the candidates for your participation. 
Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Uh, je m'appelle Martin Ménard. Good evening, everyone. My name is Martin Ménard, and I'm a journalist with La Terre de Chez Nous. It's a pleasure and an honour to be here this evening as we discuss the tremendous opportunities and some of the challenges facing Canadian agriculture. So without further ado, let's get back to our fourth question, which has to do with the grocery store conduct code. The consolidation of grocery chains has resulted in five large companies controlling over 80% of grocery sales in Canada. This system has resulted in new fees and increased costs for Canadian food producers and manufacturers, reducing their ability to invest, to create jobs and to innovate. So here's the question. Do you support the adoption of a legally binding grocery code of conduct to ensure fairness in the relationship between Canadian suppliers and retailers? And if not, what would you do to meet this ongoing challenge? Mr. McGregor, the floor is yours. Yes, in a short word, I, I absolutely do support it. Um, this is an issue that has come up repeatedly uh, from some of the major processing companies and their representatives across Canada. It was a very common theme that we heard at our recent processing study. And the thing is, um, you know, what processors were telling me is that there were so many hidden fees involved in their contracts with major grocery retailers. So they would sometimes have to pay a fee if they didn't supply enough product or if they supplied too much. There were fees about what part of the shelf their product would be displayed on. And these weren't always quite obvious in the contract. So I think it's in the interest of, of fair business practices to have open and transparent contracts, have a grocery code of conduct. And it's something absolutely uh, we need to do to level the playing field between retailers and our important processing capacity here in Canada. Thank you very much. Mr. Perron, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Menard, for this uh, highly relevant question. Of course, we're in favour of a grocery code of conduct. It's fundamental. And as my colleague, Mr. McGregor, just pointed out, there has been a substantial imbalance created between suppliers and retailers. We need to level the playing field. And yet, this is an area, there are areas of jurisdiction that we need to be mindful of. And on that note, I'd like to take my hat off in terms of the current management on the part of the Quebec Minister of Agriculture, who's chairing a committee that uh, Ms Bibot sits on. I'm sure she'll enjoy hearing that. But I think they're on the right track by doing that. But here's my misgiving, and we can debate this in a moment, but will the other parties undergate, undertake to follow up on this? It needs to be adopted at a pan-Canadian level, because if it's not, it just won't work. We need to level the playing field, and I think it'll be an opportunity to make sure that uh, there is more local produce. Nowadays, you, unfortunately, the produce isn't close to the grocery stores, and we need to do something about that too. Yes, I agree entirely with Mr. Perron. A grocery code of conduct uh, is a key piece of the puzzle, and it's our hope that our producers and processors have access uh, to our small and large retailers. In cooperation with the minister in Quebec, I've been following this file extremely closely. And to date, uh, I think we've cooperated very effectively among various groups, producers, processors, and also retailers, who've started to put a number of ideas and proposals on the table. So we still have our work cut out for us. It's an uphill battle. We're standing behind them. We, of course, want a voluntary grocery code of conduct so that as many members as possible across Canada sign off on it. We want it to bear fruit. We want to ensure that we provide the leadership so that this occurs, so that we have a solution to level the playing field between our producers, suppliers and retailers. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Mr Epp, the floor is yours. I apologize. My sound was out and I missed the question, but I think I've caught on to what it is now. So I'm going to agree with Mr Perron. 
Absolutely, that this grocery code of conduct needs to be pan-Canadian. Uh, it, would, it would introduce terrible amount of inefficiency for our multi-jurisdictional uh, processors to supply across different provinces if they had to go by different codes. As far as voluntary goes, it needs to have teeth. We have two countries that we can uh, follow their example and look at their results, Australia and the UK. The UK model is working much, much better because there's some teeth to it. And the UK model not only leads to uh, better behaviors, it actually leads to lower prices, consumer prices for consumers because the costs of doing business when they're not f between the retailer and processor are lowered and that translates into lower costs but there must be teeth and adherence to the code in order for it to be effective. That's what I'm hearing from industry. Merci beaucoup. Alors maintenant, la cinquième question. Thank you very much. Second question this evening has to do with environmental support measures. Fifth question for this evening. Producers continue each and every year to adopt new best practices to invest more time in climate mitigation measures. However, at the same time, these activities are generally dependent on fossil fuels that are taxed more and more heavily each year, even when producers do not have access to viable alternatives to fossil fuels. Here's the question. If your party is elected, what would it do to ensure that Canadian producers in environmental contributions are recognized and supported so that they remain competitive. And what would that support look like in actuality? Let's get started. Mr. Perron, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. If I could just take a step back to say that there was no two-minute open debate on the previous topic, so that might be worthwhile if we could just turn back to that in a moment. As far as environmental support measures are concerned, earlier I referred to the environmental partnership, that is, to levelling the playing field so that producers are supported on the front end, upstream, proactively. That's crucial. As far as standards are concerned, the important thing is standard reciprocity. We need to allocate the necessary resources at the inspection points, at the borders, and that we listen to stakeholders out in the field, the poultry producers, because their ideas need to be to, uh, integrated into our proposals, and I wonder why this hasn't been done to date. We also need to require the same thing of foreign products that enter Canada as those that are produced domestically. Our producers don't want fewer local standards, they just want foreign products to have to meet the same quality standards. That's crucial. When we look at the increasing taxes and uh, tariffs, we have to be very vigilant on that matter for sure. Ms. Bibo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. As far as, as, far as environmental uh, supports are concerned and how we can support uh, them, our producers, financially so that they can uh, fall into compliance with good practices uh, to, in favour of carbon sequestration to reduce our GHG emissions. We are already highly engaged and we're going to go further. There is over $200 million that has been earmarked as direct incentives to encourage our producers to adopt good practices such as crop covering and rotating crops, uh, better use of fertilisers. We're going going to triple the fund on green technology because it was just such a popular program a couple of months back. It's going to be increased to about half a billion dollars to help producers to have the means to pay for that green equipment and technology to dry their grains and to heat their facilities and also for precision farming. We also are going, Ms. Ms. Bibo, please wrap it up. We want to protect our prairies and our wetlands as well as wooded areas. Okay, I think I'm next. I couldn't hear that in the, in the lag. Correct? Go ahead. Let's take a step back. Monsieur Hep, for our technology that our farmers have adopted, zero till or low till. None of those innovative environmental responses to the challenge they faced were done in the context of a rising carbon tax. And so the Conservatives have put forward a plan, a carbon, and we've talk, we can talk about that elsewhere, but a carbon levy that 
as individuals, as farmers will pay better. The industry will respond far better to incentives than to the stick. And the industry has demonstrated that. Greenhouse gas levels are steady, are holding steady since 2008 with rising production. So our farmers will continue to be strong environmental stewards without the stick. We also have incentives in the conservative platform that will drive further innovation. But the top-down approach doesn't work. We need further collaboration with our industry groups and incentives work. Merci, Monsieur Hepp. Thank you very much, Mr. Hepp. Merci à vous. Donc maintenant, Thank Monsieur you. McGregor. Mr. McGregor, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I think it's important uh, where no alternatives exist that uh, farms uh, be given exemptions from carbon pricing. That's why I was in favor of support members bill C206, which was going to provide an exemption for grain drying because we, we heard quite clearly and plainly that there are no commercially viable options to drying grain with propane and natural gas. However, we, we do have to understand that there are opportunities to help transition farmers. And if you're looking for specific ways, what I'm interested in doing is finding those positive elements where farms actually have a, a huge potential of being one of our greatest tools in fighting climate change. I think there's incredible opportunities on farms to help them with developing renewable energy. Uh, all of those roofs uh, can be used with solar panels. A lot of them have the capacity to produce biogas with the, the compost digestion they've got on site. And like, like my conservative colleague said, there is huge carbon sequestration potential with healthy soil management. So if Ottawa can step up and provide a leadership role in helping foment those good agricultural practices, be Merci, a partner to what Mr. farmers are already doing. Thank you very much, Mr. Alors, McGregor. Now, open debate for two minutes. The floor is yours. Well, here's what I'd like to know from Mr. Epp. You referred to the carbon tax. Mr. McGregor just gave us an example. In the last parliament, we were very reasonable and we wanted to, but unfortunately an election was triggered, so the bill died on the order paper. But in the case of C206, well, we were very attentive and we wanted an, exem an exemption that the sector needed. But uh, do you believe that when it's reasonable and well done, that there should be an exemption? And what about, don't you think combining both will be more effective in the end of the day? When, when there are viable alternatives, farmers will do it on their own. There are no viable alternatives. And so that's why exemption needs to be there. We will look at, at the appropriate mechanisms together with our trading partners. The EU and the US, where we're trading internationally on grains, those are our competitors. And so when they're moving ahead with carbon pricing, we'll take a look at that as well. When innovation, which can that uh, part of the budget I absolutely agree with, is spurred, innovation provides and comes up with new viable commercial alternatives, Absolutely. I think farmers will go there on their own, and their history and their innovation has shown that. But right now, they and need an exemption. If I can add and to my, my, my previous leadership. intervention, uh, I think like you know, high inputs lead to high outputs. So ultimately, we want to help farmers reduce the number of inputs. So if we can help them reduce their, their, the pesticides they, they use, the fertilizer that they apply, that's not only going to save them money, but it's also going to help with carbon emissions further down the line. So you know, we, we do have a, a, a crisis right now where farm debt has more than doubled over the last 20 years, and many farmers are only keeping 5% of their gross farm receipts because of or all less. of the input costs which are leading to high output. So we, we do have to help mm -hmm. farmers try to mitigate that and I think there's an opportunity for leadership. For Merci, Monsieur that, McGregor. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Alors, uh, well, it's great to have an open debate, so why don't we do the open debate that we forgot about referring the Grocery Code of Conduct? Two minutes, off you go. Well, if I could just take a stab at that first, since I reminded you that you forgot about it, I have an important question. I've congratulated Minister Bibble about what approach is being undertaken, but I didn't say that it should be voluntary. Something that is uh, developed in collaboration with the industry should be mandatory 
regulatory. It should be binding. And the fact of the matter is that the industry has to agree on something that has consequences if those measures aren't met. Do you agree with me, at least on that note? Well, yes, it is a collaborative effort for the time being, so I don't want to... to uh, overstep the mark here. There are a number of scenarios on the table and there might very well be a scenario which is retained where there would be consequences, kind of a stick. But uh, let's uh, not jinx it. There's a tremendous collaborative effort underway with the leadership from our uh, department in Ottawa and the ministry in Quebec. I'm sure that we're going to find the right solution. I'm confident. Well, we just want it, don't, what, you just don't want it to be window dressing, says Mr. Perron. Exactly. Mr. The Australian F. model is voluntary and the UK model is not. And the successes to the consumers are far more evident in the UK than they are in Australia. And so I agree that a collaborative model in coming up with what works pan-Canadian, which does require federal leadership in order to get that enacted in the consultation with the partners, with the industry partners. But I'm hearing very, very clearly, as I said before, there needs to be teeth in it. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I think, you know, voluntary is is ideal, but we have to let everyone know that the writing is on the wall. And if we don't see appropriate action, government's going to do it for you. Uh, that's just the bottom line. We, we have to make sure those fair business practices are there and that uh, contracts are open and transparent. Merci, Monsieur McGregor. Alors, maintenant, Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Now we're up to question six, which has to deal with, do with supply management. Canada's dairy, poultry and egg sectors support tens of thousands of jobs across Canada. They generate millions of dollars in tax revenue and contribute billions of dollars to Canada's GDP. In order to continue to support the Canadian economy and provide Canadians with fresh, local, high-quality products Products, the supply management system must be protected. So here's the question, what will your party do to ensure that no new market access in these areas is granted in future trade agreements and that local family farms are protected? The floor is yours, Ms. Bibou. Merci. Thank you very much. The supply management system is something that all liberals believe in. Not just half of us, all of us stand behind, the, stand behind the supply management system. And that's why we stood by our commitment to protect the system, even when Donald Trump wanted to sink his teeth into it and dismantle it. We have undertaken to no longer in future trade agreements to not to cede new market access and we have an the UK would have liked more in the trade agreement with them. So our commitment is strong. We will not hand over any new market access and we're going to stick stand by the we're going to make sure that there is compensation. They, the producers know how much they're going to receive. They receive their two first payments, and poultry and egg producers know what uh, they're going to receive. And youth can also get uh, these benefits, 15% uh, less. Uh, processors know what the amount is. It's on the table, and we've committed to agree on an agreement in the upcoming year. Thank you very much. Um, between Net Mexico and, ca and Canada. Mr. Epp, the floor is yours. Yes. The Conservative Party's track record on defending supply management is clear. We support that, and through all of the trade agreements that the party negotiated, it's clear how much market access was given away. Now, still, what was given away in the past two agreements negotiated by this, uh, by this government, the industry still hasn't been paid out in the compensation that was promised. In addition, in the dairy sector, in the powdered milk sector, not I understand the to and fro and the giving of negotiating trade agreements, but you don't give away access to other markets when you're negotiating over here. So the Conservatives have committed that we will fix that in conjunction with our Cosma partners that were, or Canada's trading powdered milk to a third country, that will be addressed. Um, certainly, and the compensation will be paid out in 100 days. Our support for supply management is clear. We did not support the block motion, and so I'll preempt Mr. Pearl on this one, because uh, simply negotiating contracts, you don't indicate your bottom line, but you go by your track record. And the comparative 
Merci, M. Rapp. Le temps est écoulé. Thank you. Your time has run out. I apologize. Alors, la parole est maintenant à M. McGregor. Mr. McGregor, the floor is yours. Well, look, I, I have great respect for both my liberal and conservative colleagues here, but I think we have to remind our audience here that it was under the previous conservative government and then finished by the liberals that the trade deals were signed on the dotted line. And, and it was those trade deals which hived off percentages of our local market to foreign imports. You know, I have spoken to so many farmers supply managed industries, whether it's here in my riding or across Canada. And the whole system rests on those three important pillars, on price, price control, import control, and production control. But success have systematically weakened import control. We know farmers, or we know consumers, want fresh, locally grown products. There is absolutely no reason why we should be importing any kind of dairy eggs. Our local farmers have more than enough capacity to supply local demand, and Canadians want to buy Canadian products. So absolutely, I make that commitment. No more, uh, you know, we're not going to hive off any more of the market. We must Merci, stand Mr. firm, McGregor. follow up our Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Désolé. Sorry to cut you off. We have to continue now. It's Mr. Perron's turn. Thank you very much. Well, listen, I also have a lot of respect for my three friends here, but what we don't want is to be told we won't uh, get any, give any more concessions. We've seen this occur in the past when Mr. Epp referred to the Conservatives' track record. Well, there are, is a Conservative track record, and they've given away a lot. When Ms. Bibble says it's a firm commitment, what we want to hear is what farmers want us to say. Farmers don't want any empty promises. A supply management system won't work if there are too many foreign products coming into Canada of a lesser quality. Our consumers don't want them. It's completely illogically. One can't claim on one hand, you know, pay lip service to protecting supply management and then on the other hand, on the other hand say, well, we want to keep money in our pockets, a, a spare change. That just doesn't stand up to the light of reason. So what I'd like to hear from my three friends here, will you be voting? yes or no, for our new bill, C216. It died on the order paper because of this useless election, I might point out. Thank you very much, Mr. Perron. The table is set for an excellent debate. You have two minutes to discuss the issue. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, yes, uh, to, to Monsieur Perron, I, I will make a commitment to voting in favour of that bill because, you know, we hear a lot of words in the House of Commons, but it's important to have those words backed up with real action and you can't escape a piece of legislation. So if we have it written into the Department of Foreign Affairs Act that we will no longer trade away any of our domestic market share for our supply managed industries, I think that's a firm commitment and one that should be legally binding. I will jump in here and after spending 25 plus years negotiating contracts in the agriculture industry, very seldom do I go into a negotiation with my partner and say, here are my cards, now let's talk. That's why I voted against it. Our track record is solid. Absolutely to your point, Mr. Perron, uh, from non-tariff trade barriers and standards, that needs to be addressed. But uh, the opposition to the block bill does not come from a support or lack of support from supply management. It simply comes from the process of negotiating any kind of a deal where you don't show your cards up front. Alors pour ma part, well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm the member for Compton Stansted in the Eastern Townships. It's a dairy riding, and I understand what these uh, supply management producers are facing. We've kept our word. We said that we would protect the system, and that's exactly what we did. We said that we would compensate them, and that is exactly what we did. It's already on the table, that compensation. And there's the third agreement that's going to be fine-tuned in this upcoming year. We kept our word in this third agreement, and that is that we will no, give away no further market access or share in supply managed sectors in the next contract. It's as clear as straightforward as that. We need to remember that all other sectors that aren't supply managed, well, we opened up markets in the past years in 50 countries to 1.6 billion consumers. So 
we need to take into consideration all the agriculture sectors, but also other sectors. Ms. Bibor, the time has run out, unfortunately, and we have to take a quick break for a video presentation, and then we'll be back. Sean will take the floor again. He'll be asking interesting, stimulating questions. I'm sure it'll be highly interesting. Agriculture is your source of Canadian agricultural news and insight on the issues impacting your industry. With the full suite of e-newsletters, podcasts, and video series, Real Agriculture is truly unique in its quest to keep the industry informed on issues that matter. Real Ag Radio can be heard every weekday on Rural Radio 147 on Sirius XM or by podcast download. The Agronomist is a weekly live streaming program on Monday nights dedicated to the latest in agronomic issues. And now, starting Friday, September 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern, Real Agriculture is excited to premiere its new show, Real Ag Politics. This first episode is an opportunity for post-debate discussion and analysis on how agriculture has the opportunity to shape the 2021 election. Tune in for more debate coverage on Real Ag Politics at realagriculture.com backslash live or log into Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. If you care about agricultural policy, what's on the mind of influencers, and where the buck stops for lawmakers, Real Ag Politics is for you. Thank you, Martin. It's now time for the rapid fire round. There are four questions and four debaters. So each participant gets the chance to go first. This is gonna be a lot of fun. I'll ask the question and each debater's answer will be yes or no. After everyone has stated their position, they will then have 30 seconds to either expand on their answer or respond to a fellow participant. I ask all of our debaters to try to hold to this 30 seconds. I'll uh, be pretty tight on the time. Here we go. Rapid fire questions. Do you believe the Canada Grain Act needs urgent modernization? First up, oh, sorry. First up is Mr. Perron. Oui. Yes, I do. Madame Babo? Oui. Yes. Mr. App? I'm Mr. Rep may have lost audio. Oh. But I'm not sure what happened there, so I'm sorry I missed all that. Okay, sorry. The, the question is, do you believe the Canada Grain Act needs urgent modernization? Absolutely it does. Okay, and finally, Mr. McGregor. Uh, yes. Okay, now you each, each uh, debater has 30 seconds to tell us why or challenge somebody else's answer. First up will be Mr. Perron. Well, this is crucial. Each piece of legislation, each framework needs to be regularly reviewed over time because things changed. And our farmers know, given climate change, and diplomatic difficulties that they've experienced and we've experienced, that there needs to be more rapid relief. For example, and I know 30 seconds isn't very much, but let me just highlight one particularly important thing that needs to be reviewed. It's crucial, and I'm pleased to see that all of my colleagues here agree with my position on that. Madame Bibo. Absolutely, and this is why we have started this uh, very in-depth consultation to which I have participated to, to many roundtables to understand this issue better. Uh, there's definitely, it's definitely time to modernize uh, the Canada Grain Act. Uh, I mean, the, the, trading, tr the trading world has changed significantly in the last 50 years. And uh, the inspection system is also very different. So there are a lot of issues to be considered there Please are different up. views and uh, i'm committed to continue this process okay we're out of time mr mcgregor uh, uh yes i mean this is something that uh we we have seen hints of and i'm glad to see the consultations that are going ahead i mean i don't want to presuppose what the legislation is going to look like but i have certainly heard from primary producers that uh, they they do want some significant changes in terms of the relationship they have with uh, grain handling companies. So we will be, we'll be looking closely at that. And I'm going to jump in and agree with much, as, uh, much of what has been said. Through trade agreements, changes there, uh, the, re the regulations here needed a lot of updating. And this would be symptomatic of a whole host of other regulatory frameworks 
the conservatives will put a great deal of energy reviewing, making more efficient, bringing up to code and up to, up to uh, date. Thank you, everybody, for being short and concise on your answers. Really appreciate it. Let's go to question number two. Do you support further legislation, including criminal charges, to deter trespassing during on-farm and processing plant activism? Madame Bibo. Trespassing is y yes or no against. Sorry, yes oh. or no. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure the way the question was asked, so it's not clear to me if it's maybe. So, uh, do, do you sub do you support further legislation, including criminal charges, to deter trespassing during on-farm and processing plant activism? No. No? Mr. Epp? Yes, absolutely. Mr. McGregor? Yes. And Mr. Perron? Oui. Yes, I do. Madame Babo, you answered no. You have 30 seconds. So, trespassing on farms is already illegal. And this is the responsibility of the police uh, the enforcement uh, is, is under the responsibility of the police. CFIA is there with their uh, inspector. They are scientists, veterinarian veter vets, and uh, their responsibility and what we can ask them is to follow up on biosecurity, not on illegal okay. trespassing. These are two very different Thank you. responsibilities. Mr. Epp? Trespassing may be illegal, but it hasn't stopped the incidents from occurring, and therefore we need to address this issue. Um, the mental health of farmers, the, and far more importantly, uh, not that that isn't important, but the biosecurity of our industry, African swine fever, a whole host of avian diseases can be spread by this kind of activity. Protesting is a fundamental Canadian right. Trespassing uh, and, and disruption of farming activities is not and needs to be criminalized. Mr. McGregor. Yeah, so we we did have a, a recent attempt in the previous parliament through private members bill C205, which is going to amend the Health of Animals Act. And I'm glad to see that through our committee deliberations, we amended that bill so that biosecurity concerns and measures would apply to everyone equally because protesters couldn't inadvertently bring it in, but it could also happen from farm employees. So um, if biosecurity is the concern, we have to make sure that it applies equally to everyone who may come into contact with animals. Thank you. Mr. Pro. Oui, alors, uh, y a des bons points sont yes, well, there have been some excellent points raised, and Ms. Bibor has raised an important jurisdictional issue, which isn't incorrect, but in practice, there is trespassing that's occurring, and how is it that there is no upshot to this? We need to protect our pharmacists, and I don't think we have the right to refuse to protect our farmers. Biosecurity is one way to do it. It's a different way. It helps us to provide an additional layer of protection. I think we need to move along with, uh, with that. We've talked about mental health of workers and never forget that trespassing is you, an act of aggression and that is just not allowed. We're on to rapid fire question number three. Do you support the intent behind Bill C-208 ensuring farm families will not pay more to transfer farms to family members than unrelated third parties? We will start with Mr. Epp. Absolutely. Mr. McGregor. Yes. Mr. Perron? Absolutely. And Absolutely. Madame Lebeau? Yes. Okay, each candidate will have 30 seconds. We'll start with Mr. Epp. Why? I am, I am shocked and confused. Minister, you voted against this legislation, as did your party. I do not understand. How can you, the tax unfairness of this measure that was trying to correct, uh, uh, the, how can you say here and support it, and yet you voted against it? I am looking forward to this explanation. I stand with our farmers. Farmers aren't smiling. Thank you, Mr. Epp. Madame Babo, we'll get to you in a second. Mr. McGregor. Well, first of all, I want to give a shout out to former member of parliament Guy Caron uh, from the previous parliament because it was he who brought in the original bill that sought to, to, to fix this. And I'm glad to see that's picked it up.
up. Um, I think when you talk with uh, small farms, there's a crisis in, in demographics. They need to find an easy way to pass that farm along to a family member to keep it within the family. Uh, and, and if this measure helps with that, that's, that's why I was there to support it. And I believe it's an important change. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Madame Bobo. Well, absolutely. Personally speaking, and the Liberal Party supports uh, the intergenerational transfer of farms. And it was part of the mandate as Minister of Finance and, Minister, and me as Minister to facilitate these intergenerational transfer of farms. Unfortunately, the way the legislation was put forward was incomplete. That's why we didn't support it. The bill, however, is, has been enacted today, and that is a good thing because we want to make sure that intergenerational transfer of farms is possible. We're going to get on to question number four. Oh, sorry, uh, we uh, pardon? didn't get to Mr. Perron. I'm sorry. Oui. Quand même important. Thank Alors, you. Uh, yes, please don't <laughs> forget me. Mr. McGregor mentioned that the bill had already been tabled by the New Democrats, by the Bloc, and by the Conservatives, and I co sponsored the bill. All the opposition parties agreed on it, and that's the beauty of a minority government. Now, we're on the hustings. Some people are saying they're in favour of this when they voted against it in reality. The Liberal government said that it wanted to bring changes to this bill. We need to be vigilant and make sure that the spirit of the legislation is protected and also fill any gaps that might exist. Our work is cut out for us. Should Canada be more assertive in pursuing non-tariff barriers to trade through international dispute and retaliatory measures? We'll start with Mr. McGregor. So the question is in asserting. Can you repeat it one more time? Yeah, we'll repeat the question. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, should Canada be more assertive in pursuing non-tariff barriers to trade through international dispute and retaliatory measures? Uh, yes, if I understand the question properly. Sorry. Mr. Pearl? Oui. Yes, indeed. Mad Madame Bibo? Oui. And Mr. Yes. Al yes. Okay. Mr. McGregor, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, so let's start with uh, an example that's probably on many farmers' minds. That's our trade dispute with China, where at a stroke of a pen, they blocked 40% of our canola seed export because of perceived phytosanitary concerns. They have yet to produce a shred of evidence. And we know that this uh, part of their long-term game uh, in, in something responding to something that's injurious to their national pride. So yeah, we need to have a rules-based yeah. order where if you are gonna make these kind of claims, you have to back it up Thank with you, evidence Mr. McGregor. and not just block trade. Mr. Perron. Yes, indeed. But this is a complicated situation and it should be done case by case. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to stand up to our biggest, our bigger neighbour, the US, that sometimes changes the rules along the way. And uh, as far as China is concerned, the same is true. We have to stand up for ourselves and defend ourselves. When I spoke earlier of the emergency fund. We have to speak up. We have to protect ourselves, but we have to help those that are being impacted. So fast. I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, Madame Bobo? Yes, absolutely. And we are there to stand for a rule-based order. It's really important. And we always work very collaboratively with the industry because these questions are very delicate. We have to balance uh, every situation uh, case by case. And actually, con to the contrary of the conservative, we are reinvesting in our regulatory agencies to give them more resources to, uh, so we will have more professionals in the field, uh, including our trade commissioners in different countries, to be there to support. Thank you very much. And finally, Mr. Epp. Canada needs to make, take a much stronger international stand on matters such as this. I recognize that we're a smaller country and a smaller trading bloc, but we have allies. We have our Kanzuk allies. We need to link arm, uh, arm in arm on some of these issues. 
And I understand delicate balances, but we can stand on principle and we can stand with our allies. And that's not what's been happening with this government at all. You're smiling again. Trust me, farmers aren't. Thank you, Mr. Epp. That is the end of the rapid fire round. Those 30 seconds go so fast. We've, we're gonna now move on to our final two questions for this evening. The seventh question deals with research. Canadian agriculture has experienced unparalleled productivity gains over the past 50 years, driven by innovations. Currently, these gains are starting to plateau with a need to revitalize Canada's agricultural research infrastructure. If elected, what would your party do to ensure Canada has a research system capable of realizing Canadian potential as a global leader in agri-food? And we will start with Mr. Epp. Thank you, Sean. Absolutely, it's a fantastic question. We need to focus our efforts as a government on the regulatory aspects, on the commercial commercialization of what our research community, what our innovative community does. It's our regulatory frameworks, just like we talked about in the Canada Grains Act, our bringing to market, our bringing through the patent system, all of that system needs to be focused. We have tremendous financial pressures as a country right now. Absolutely, we can harness the ability of the private sector to do more on our research, partner with them for more of the practical research side, government needs to focus on regulatory reform so that commercialization, so the outcomes of our fantastic research community are developed right here in Canada. Mr. McGregor, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of, of our scientists who, who are working in agricultural uh, technology and innovation. Um, you know, in the public service, you know, I've had the opportunity to tour some of the agriculture and agri-food research uh, stations, notably one in, in Summerland in the Okanagan. And the work they do is amazing. I, I would like to see uh, more dedicated public research. I would like to see the federal government commit more to this so that the, the benefits from that research can be realized by all farmers. Also, when you when you speak to those who are engaged in, in private research, um, often the biggest barrier to them are the upfront capital costs. I mean, they, they may have that great idea, but they don't have access to capital in order to see it realized into something that, that to go from something that's on paper to an actual product. And so I think, you know, Providing those first set of startup funds uh, is going to be crucial to helping it along. Mr. Pearl? Oui, absolutely. Écoutez, investissement... Yes. Huge investments in research and development are crucial. I'd go so far as to say is it's urgent. The deans from the faculties of universities have undoubtedly met my counterparts to delve into this issue, which I would categorise as terrible when it comes to research in universities. Re research centres also need more funding and daily support. That's crucial. As far as research is concerned, what about the future? Let me give you the example of Health Canada and what it intends to do. They need to do the opposite of what they've announced, increase funding to research and development and make sure that there are replacement products if necessary and new practices. When I referred earlier to support on the front end, that's crucial, but the research has to be effective. A company that has enough cash flow and financial autonomy will be able to upgrade its facilities and head in the right direction when it comes to R&D. It's crucial when it comes to agri-foods and agriculture. Gotta, i got to jump in here, and sorry to interrupt you. We're going to finish up with Madame Bibot. Thank you. Well, uh, after uh, almost 10 years of the Conservative, with $400 million cut in researches, we were back investing in research, investing in science. We have reopened research centers. We have rehired almost 75 new scientists. And I'm particularly proud of our Living Labs initiative, which we are making it more important with an additional financing of $185 million. So bringing our scientists in the field with our farmers to be sure that it really applies to their priority. The agri-science programs with $338 million were, was able to support many projects. And uh, just think about the supercluster for protein. You know, how many projects will 
a flow from this super cluster. So we do believe in research and innovation uh, and we will keep investing in there. Thank you, Madame Bebeau. We've heard from all of our candidates. It's now time to get into our two minutes of open debate. I turn the floor over to the debaters. The private sector's innovative ability needs to be unleashed. What I keep hearing from the sector is that it's our regulatory system that is not allowing uh, that to be commercialized. So absolutely, we need federal funding into base research, but so often it's the commercialization thereof that needs to take taking a look at, and that's where a federal conservative government will focus. Mr. Pearl? It's interesting to... Well, here's what I'd like to know. Do my counterparts agree with university researchers demand, deans who have spoken to all our political parties, demanding massive investment in research centres? That's the first question. Second question, is it normal that four elected representatives don't have access to the Normandin experimental farm last year on the pretext that it would serve partisanship? We're elected officials. We need to make decisions for the future. Then needs to be some degree of transparency when it comes to access to facilities. Well, we demonstrated the extent to which we believe in research and science. We invested hundreds of millions of dollars. ...to hear my Conservative colleague talk about uh, regula improving reg the regulatory system while when the Conservative is in power, you just cut in the resources of our agencies. So I wonder how you would you know, improve the regulatory system while you would be cutting again in the regulatory agencies uh, while we have it reinvested in CFI and PMRA. We, we have not talked about cuts. We're talking about refocusing. We're not talking about cuts to ag funding here at all, but we are talking about a refocusing so that the private sector can thrive in Canada and their innovation is not exported. And maybe I'll just jump in very quickly to give a shout out to the Dean's Council because I've had many very uh, good and thoughtful pr um, conversations with them and they are certainly a resource we want to rely on more and more. Per research is a very lively topic, clearly. We're going to get to our final question. It is the eighth question of this evening and it deals with infrastructure priorities. So on-farm innovation is a moot point if farmers cannot access markets both in Canada and abroad. Whether it's a continued lack of reliable internet or bottlenecks that threaten Canada's ability to get products to market, infrastructure is critical to the future. What are your party's priorities when it comes to addressing vulnerabilities in infrastructure that continue to hamper opportunities for Canadian farmers? We will start with Mr. McGregor. Yeah, this is a, a great question. Let's start with our internet infrastructure. I mean, we hear uh, it's a perennial problem because I've heard about each of the years that I've been the agriculture critic. And, you know, with today's uh, equipment relying so heavily on connection to the internet, today's equipment, uh, we, we have to make sure that those services are out there. It's important for farmers' mental health. It's important that they have access to those broadband networks. So it's incredibly important for the future of agriculture that we do extend that as quickly as possible, a reliable internet service to our rural communities. When it comes to our trade infrastructure, our rail and ports, uh, living uh, on Canada's Pacific coast, I'm close to our largest port, we need to find efficiencies in how our ships are arriving because huge bottlenecks with freighters parking all over the Gulf Islands and it's causing a lot of havoc over here. So we need to find a way where ships are arriving for just in time loading and Thank that's you, Mr. McGregor. require significant You're out of time. investments. Mr. Pearl? Yes, thank you very much. Several things. The minute will be short. We were glad with the decision to transfer monies to Quebec for the internet with a time frame of 2022. Hopefully things will move quickly. But what about cell networks? There are a lot of gaps in the cell networks in rural Canada and rural Quebec. We need a dedicated program to address that problem. Folks just can't cope with it anymore. Of 
course, infrastructure. We need to overhaul infrastructure for processing. We've seen with, in the midst of COVID how reliant we are on a couple of uh, processing facilities. We need an overhaul to make sure that there is more regional processing that can occur and so that business people, that is our farmers, are able to innovate and we need to provide them with cash flow to be able to do that. Unfortunately, their debt levels are too high and they don't have enough cash flow. We need to support them on the front end. I've said this on many occasions this evening, but we need to help our business people. Madame Bibo. Merci. Avec un Thank you. Well, there's been an $8 billion investment. Mr. Perron, you're not on mute. We had just heard about your cat. But there's been an investment of $8 billion to accelerate internet connectivity. And we've committed to this actually being carried out. The time frame is now 2025. You know, an increased level of collaboration with provinces and actually the, uh, the large national carriers as well, as we've done in Quebec. We can bring this deadline even shorter. And uh, I hope we will be able to do the same as we've done in Quebec to make it, you know, uh, 2022. But for the time being, we are putting the resources in place and our commitment toward uh, everyone across the country is to have high speed Internet by 2025. We have invested $4.2 billion in the National Trade Corridors uh, Fund. And uh, this, this, for example, um, to, to help products get to market and in Vancouver around the port uh, it, it was Madame Bibo I'm gonna have to cut you off you'll have to save products. it for the open debate and we'll finish up with Mr. Epp. Madame Bibo I want to thank you for your moment of clarity when if, if I quote actually you said and actually this is going to be carried out as opposed to all the infrastructure announcements that have been made over the last six years and then the Auditor General has pointed out how many millions of dollars have been left unspent I agree with all of us here that the rural internet broadband access, that's the utility that electricity was 100 years ago. It's critical. It's in our platform by 2025. The difference is we won't just announce it. We won't just announce we're going to plant 2 billion trees. We'll actually do it. And that's what needs to happen. Let me add beyond internet, there's a $4.5 billion municipal infrastructure deficit across this country. There needs to be that much more into our roads and bridges, which is also critical to our rural and farm community. Thank you, Mr. Rep. Okay, this is our last question. This is your last two minutes to go after each other, so let's get to it. I send the floor back to you. Sure, maybe I'll start just Don't by saying, I, you know, I think the last 18 months have really uh, shown us just how critical the internet is. I mean, we, we're all out here and we'd love to see more of each other in person but you know for our small rural communities and for small farms they've they've had to really change their business model to to trying to sell their products directly on online marketplaces and if they don't have that reliable access to the internet they just simply can't take advantage of that so I'm glad to see that this is really focused this issue uh, and and I think you see some broad agreement here that getting that internet infrastructure out to our rural communities is so crucial I agree. Can I'm not in a very rural area here, and I think I've rebooted. What I'd like to know, what I'd like to know, and so. Mr. Perron, go ahead. Sorry, that's the lag. Yeah, we got a bit of a lag. Mr. Perron, go. Well, thank you. Here's what I'd like to know from my colleagues. Which, who, which of you agree in decentralizing financial decisions from farms that uh, they are incapable of knowing what needs they need to promote innovation? Do we agree that this is what needs to be done? in terms of the major principle. Well, in the negotiation that we'll be having in the next year to enter into the Canadian Partnership for Agriculture 2022-2028, there are major pan-Canadian programs and also significant amounts of money that we transferred to the provinces. Last time it was about $300 million that was transferred to the province of Quebec, Mr. Perron. And that will enable each province to prioritize its uh, finance sectors as they see fit and in terms of what is on the ground in their provinces. I'll add a little bit more time because we had a slight delay there. So, Mr. Rep, you can finish up your point very quickly. 
Yeah, uh, just my experience here this evening with my own internet cutting out and I'm on the 42nd parallel in a fairly built up area. It's crucial, internet, rural infrastructure absolutely needs further attention by uh, the next conservative government. So it's unbelievable this time has gone so fast. That concludes our debate questions for this evening. It's been my pleasure to help moderate this debate. Thank you to the sponsor, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, and all of our debaters, as well as our major sponsor. I want to encourage everybody, as you saw the commercial earlier, to check out Real Ag Politics at realagriculture.com slash live tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to turn the floor back to my colleague, Martin Menard, who will close this evening's event. Well, we're already at the end of the debate this evening. Thank you to everyone. It's uh, time to make your closing remarks. You have one minute each to do so, and we'll get started with Mr. McGregor. We'll start off by uh, sincerely thanking the Canadian Federation of Agriculture for their continued advocacy. They, they are a massive umbrella organization that have many stakeholders within their ranks, and they are a force to be reckoned with in Ottawa. They, they do serve you well. They make sure that your issues are always top of mind for policymakers in our capital. Um, you know, being the, the NDP's agriculture critic for the last three and a half years has been an absolute dream job because I've always had a passion for food, for food security and our farmers. And to be able to play a part in the national conversation uh, has been an incredible honor. I hope uh, from the interactions that I've had with many of you over the years, do you end that I live and breathe agriculture. I, I love having a part to play in this. And, you know, we have tremendous opportunity before us. Yes, many challenges, but it's nothing that we can't overcome as a country because that's what Canada is known for. So thank you very much for listening and I uh, hope you all do well in the weeks ahead. Take care. Excellent. Merci. Alors, Excellent. Monsieur Perron, Mr. Perron, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Listen, I'd like to thank the Canadian Federation of Agriculture and also my colleagues for the cordial exchanges that we've enjoyed. And I'd also particularly like to thank Canadian Quebec farmers who are listening to us today and are getting informed. As I said in my introductory remarks, I spoke about the relevancy of the Bloc Québécois in the federal parliament. We've demonstrated this clearly over the past 20 months, and we've done so again in this debate. Our opinions are logical, they're unifying. We have have made positive proposals. Unfortunately, not everyone who's listening to us will have will be voting for us. But what I'd like to say that uh, we want in Quebec to have power to be able to do what we need to do for Quebec. We've spoken to Bill C-206 that didn't affect Quebec, that we nevertheless collaborated on. So we're playing a constructive role here. The farming world needs folks that cooperate and are looking for innovative solutions for the future. And we'll be there at the helm over the upcoming months. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Bibol, the floor is yours. Merci. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, the team of uh, CFI for organizing oui. this debate. Our Liberal Party has a vision that is a long-term and sustainable. We recognize that the agricultural sector can play a big role in our economic recovery and our fight against climate change and in the vitality of our rural communities as well. That's why a it's Liberal good. government is prepared to continue delivering for you including new actions to address labor shortage, increase on-farm sustainable management practices and clean technologies, strengthen local supply chains, implement the next agricultural framework to improve BRM programs and advance shared priorities with the sector. I have a lot of admiration for you and the work that you do, to do that, the work that you do every day to feed Canadians and people worldwide. It's certainly a complex sector, but one filled with opportunities. Madame and Bibot, together, we will continue. Ms. Bibot, please wrap it up. Thank you. Excellent. Alors, pour terminer, Monsieur Good. Epp, Mr. Epp, the floor is yours, last but not least. 
Thank you to the CFA, thank you to the moderators, and to my colleagues for this lively debate. Agriculture is a shared jurisdiction between the federal and provincial governments with a 60-40 cost share that's the most common programming arrangement. Intuitively, this relationship should suggest a leadership role for the federal government, and that's where this government has fallen time and again. Conservatives will defend supply management, open new markets, and ensure that our farm safety net programs are predictable, bankable, and manageable. It was only in response to conservative pressure that this government went to the provinces to address power imbalances between big retailers and their suppliers, introducing a grocery code of conduct, as we discussed. The minister herself and most of her colleagues voted against restoring tax fairness as farmers transfer their operations to their children. Conservatives understand agriculture, and conservatives know that agriculture is an important part of Canada's COVID recovery and an important part of responsible environmental stewardship. Thank you all. Merci à vous. Merci à vous tous. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. It's my sincere thanks to all of you. And we'd also like to thank our sponsor for this evening, our main sponsor. And uh, food, that is food, health and consumer products of Canada. And we'd like to thank you, our audience, for having taken the trouble to listen to this debate. We hope that you enjoyed it. And on behalf of the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, thank you and have a good evening, everyone.